Yeah, sorry, Welcome to Talking in the Wilderness. The 13th I started opening up a roll 20 just out of habit. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got to have well. roll 20 open. Otherwise, it's just going to show a black screen on stream. So I'm just, using, yeah, I'm just using the layout from the regular tabletop stream. I'll, I'll pop in, I guess. <laughs> Why not? I'm already on roll 20. Might as well. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, I'm going to be the last one out. Okay, we are we are actually live. It is live on Tinker Tabletop. Excellent. Wow, wow. even the mannequins for the overlay are accurate for who's here. Yes, I yes. did that. Excellent. <laughs> I actually did that on purpose. Yeah. Wow. Welcome to talking, talking in the wilderness. Yes. 13th age talk show. Yes. Because our DM is at an anime convention. Nerd. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> or on his way back. We're not really sure where he is right now. He's somewhere. not here. <laughs> the DM is <laughs> And when the DM is away, the, the players will play. Well, well drink talk. heavily. And talk about things. Quick, everybody yes. has zero to your health. Your health. <laughs> Add a bunch of instant cakes. <laughs> Everybody's inventory. I now have oh, God, 720 no. health. No more, no more instant cakes. Damn it, I should have put a question about instant cake. God, no more instant cake, please. 420 health and 69 recoveries. We ran that into the ground and then through the ground and then back out of the ground again and then back into the ground. And then we set yeah. the instant cake on fire. Right. Not yet, but that's coming. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and other, to Voices in the Wilderness. To Voices in the Voices of the Wilderness. Something like that. Did we agree yeah, on yeah. that? Yeah. You do, you do good, Sonny. Um, no, no. <laughs> our, our puffin of ceremonies tonight is Nick. <laughs> and, and it's already gone to shit. So, welcome. <laughs> welcome, one and all. It's um, like a new record for our RP adventures. For going to shit. We started on time, which would probably piss Dan off. We did start on time. Yeah, that's true. I appreciate that so much. Don't because anybody it tell was me that. <laughs> right, guys. Um, basically, to give a little bit of forewarning or foreshadowing or what have you, um, this is a RPG. Uh, based in the world, loosely, of 13th Age, um, a campaign where you create characters and try and convince the DM that you're heroes. That doesn't know, matter. Know. It, well, but well, some well. of us, a percentage of us. One, one third of our party is heroes. That's actually, yeah, <laughs> a third of the party. Yep. I'm sure that each of us has a percentage of hero. Somewhere the other four of us are person. somewhere in that morally gray region. What, what isn't hero game. has been stolen from heroes, so... Look at their kneecaps. <laughs> <laughs> if we steal enough heroes' kneecaps, then maybe we'll all be heroes at the end. It's like that uh, sock problem where it's like if you keep patching the same sock because it stole the same sock. It's like Carnifex is like probably the third most heroic of all of us, which is weird. Yeah, because he's a demon. And regularly tells the entire party to die in a fire. Yes, he rather he's rather from So this is kind of segued into my first little bit, which was basically telling everyone a little bit about each character. Um, we're talking about a character who isn't here right now because he is somewhere on a ship in the middle of nowhere. Which isn't great for campaigning. He makes it work. He makes it work. Like four months. God Five bless months. that man. Keeping Canada safe. Keeping Canada safe is our good friend Dollard, who plays a paladin demon uh, called Carnifex, who has currently, story-wise, busted his leg and is on desk duty for the foreseeable future until he can catch up with us later 
I'm sure he'll set it straight and, and just and just wander over at some point. Um, to talk about someone who is here, um, maybe does anybody want to go first? I said we just go left to right across the the character screen here. That'll work. Yeah, I'm good with that. I'll I'll know, know. <laughs> nominate Jay right off the bat, but. <laughs> in a line, everybody has just stepped back and Jay has stood still. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, basically. Um, I mean... Uh, the spotlight shines down on him. Just the rest I, of the I gotta stage think, with, with you all, I think Malkesh is very open, so there's not a whole lot he's keeping from you all as, as characters. But I guess for people that are just watching, um, hi, I play a character called Malkesh, who is a... Uh, hybrid sorcerer necromancer character um he is the quote-unquote healer of the party though he has very unusual means of doing so which uh is actually very apropos for malkesh um he started off as kind of a snake oil salesman uh but he's actually learned how to heal people but he did so not by actually learning medicine, he learned it by stealing souls out of people and, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's about, I mean, as a short summary, I guess that works. I'm sure uh, many doctors wish that they could do the same. Yeah, yeah, oh, well, for sure. <laughs> Especially around midterm time. <laughs> yeah, Malkash is definitely a healer. He just happens to heal by ripping the souls out of people. And then shoving them into other people. He's kind yeah. of like a <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Uh, and we met Malkesh a bit back, didn't we? Uh, yes. What, like two years ago? Yeah. I think, that was, I think that was the first episode I started listening Green, to. Was Green Blades was, was yep. still around? Yep. Uh, for the record, for anybody who's just started listening, um, this campaign's been going on for nearly, well, it, has it been four years, nearly five, or is it three years, uh, nearly four? I think it's been around, coming up on four years. And so we've been doing, doing this particular adventure. We did, we have had a couple of shakeups. We have before we've got sort of the, the, uh, core, uh, that we have at the moment. And we did have former characters, some of us, because when you're just trying something out for the first time, you know, you, you choose you choose something, and if it doesn't fit right, then you just you just change it later on. Yeah, and, and sometimes you have three rogues in the party, and you realize exactly. we shouldn't have three rogues in the party. See, I was always for, for making a rogue. When I talked to Dan, he's like, the only thing you can't do is make a rogue. And I said... I always play rogues, and he's like, a fucking course you do. <laughs> <laughs> See, when I was invited to the side session, nobody said anything. Oh, gosh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But we needed a skill monkey, and then there were no traps, so it didn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah, he basically said you can make anything you want as long as it's not a rogue, because we have three rogues. So go crazy. And I said, I don't know the system. Um, uh... <laughs> so I found Sorcerer. Had to play a goblin. Uh, I think me and Dan share a lot of similar enjoyment in that, both that aesthetic and um, and frogs, too. Gotta throw the frogs in. Um, but I think the difference between I think Dan's goblin characters and I think Malkesh is best way I can describe it is that Z's and other goblins I think we've met as NPCs are very much so wow goblins whereas Malkesh is very much a pathfinder goblin uh, which yeah, he's we've encountered he's yeah he's, he's much more willing to eat your toes uh, than I think Z's would necessarily <laughs> he's got some points all over so, uh, yeah, I think that's the primary kind of change. And the, the reason, quite plainly, at least in my mind, is that Malkesh didn't grow up a normal family life. Um, he was basically enslaved at a very young age uh, by the orcs and put to menial labor and learned a sort of bastardized form of alchemy just 
because they figured he could be useful at stirring pots so they didn't have to do it. Um, but that's why he doesn't have the... He's not a very good businessman. He's tried, but he's not good at it. He's decent at lying, but just not very good otherwise. He's not a very good alchemist, though he has found some sources that make him capable. Sweet Tooth's Guide to Alchemy helped a lot in his ability to make potions, but there are still some... Uh, would you say unintended consequences? Probably the best way to describe that. <laughs> That's probably the best way to describe Malkesh in general. Yeah, yeah Malkesh is. I like to. I I play Malkesh as a cartoon character, a particularly violent cartoon character, but a cartoon character nonetheless. Uh, it helps that he is extremely difficult to kill. Um, not only do I have five failures on a death save to actually die, I don't actually go down after I when I reach that downed state. I can continue to fight and play and I can rip the souls out of things when they have less than 20 health and heal which will get me right back out of that death state. <laughs> so I kind of play him like he's squishy. And, and that's he's probably not, not... the least corrupt sort of character that you can play in 13 Age <laughs> as well. <laughs> because I'm sure we've got a couple of banned ones that we weren't allowed to have a look at. Yeah. yeah. But um... Yeah, I think that's Malkesh in a, in, a, in a nutshell. Next time Malkesh has business cards, unintended consequences needs to be the catchphrase. Yeah. yeah, big bold letters across the business card. Unintended consequences. Okay. Oh, that so, was great, Jake. Thank you. Very welcome. <laughs> Did you want no, to keep going? Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm good. No, you can keep going if you want. No, no you got to go next now, Lissy. The audience is invested in your little puff, and they want to hear about Lissy. <laughs> I noticed that. Um, right. Puffin with new hat. It's actually yeah. an old hat. It's been around for a long time. It is. It is. And it goes and it comes back. Um, Lissy is a Arkby, which was introduced to... Um, the main sort of storyline ages ago now with uh, a, an Ockby called Arlando Arlando um, and uh, once I, I did have an assassin character who was a rogue <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, called Greenblades who was really he was funny but you know, she was she was very grumpy, but then Carnifex was really grumpy, and so we had too much grump for the people that we had. And I think the system, we were looking for someone to support, and and this was before was the, no, this wasn't before Malkesh, but something happened where we needed something. It was a side session. Oh, Malkesh was yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. It was for the side session. Um, and then I had so much fun with the side session that I kept Alyssa, as well as the naming convention for all Arkbees, which is a repetitive sort of... Uh, her, her name is Alyssa Alyssa. Um, we've met a few different types of Arkbees, like Rixus. Uh, I, but I forget what Rixus is. How does Rixus's name go? There's just Rick Von Rixus, I think is what. Is, is it Rick Von Rixus? It, yeah. Okay. Which, uh, as an aside, I love. I thought it was Rick X Rixus. Right? Is it Rick X Rixus? I thought it was Rick. I thought it was Rick I X Rixus. I think. Maybe maybe I always wanted to call him Rick Von Rixus. <laughs> <laughs> Rick Von Rixus yeah, is pretty good. good. The naming convention was just it was Most, just uh, that was just something recently. I played off of. Most recently, we had uh, the pilot of the ship, Luke, Luke, Lucas. Yes, Luke, oh, Luke, God, Lucas. Yes. And he's like a, <laughs> it's weird. They're all kind of seabirds. So, like, I think, I think the majority are kind of puffinish or penguinish. But we have discussed like different different types of seabirds uh, to end up as the Arkby race. Um, and they, sh she started out in a side campaign with Ferris who after many after maybe about a year I finally got his name right um <laughs> because we would Fenris go was a big we, we would go through Fenris we would go through um 
I think what else did I? I uh, I just I think I you just straight up called it. called him Fenrir a couple times. Yeah, Fenrir. <laughs> that was good. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, that was how Tyler's character got introduced into the main campaign, and then I switched over to Lissy. Uh, Lissy is a captain of a very small fleet of ships. She, she might. Sorry, I say captain, admiral, admiral. Yeah, admiral. Well, clarification. What, what, yeah, these are not. This is not a small fleet of ships. These are small ships. Well, it's a fleet, fleet of small the, ships. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's it, they're very small <laughs> ships. They can fit through a doorway and follow her around. Yes, they do. They do follow me around. Um, they also just happen to be the souls of the recently departed, um, much in the same way of Malkesh. Uh, some of which Lissy... happen to be my family members. Yeah, some of which happen to be his family members. Um, oh boy. Yeah, that that did not go Mild down conflict. well. A lot of the things that Lissy does doesn't doesn't go down very well. Um, if. Malkesh's unintended consequences, Lysia's unexpected results. Um, <laughs> oh god, their she... children would be horrifying. Say that again. Ah, <laughs> uh, do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> no, you do not. Alright, cool, then I won't. Do I not want to hear it? Um... I think he's shipping us. I think that's what he's saying. Right. <laughs> oh! yeah. There might be a little oh, bit of that. Well, Although, as long as with, I can with already how tiny they here. are, like this drinking in size. I mean, who else the would I ship would be microscopic. with? Um, I mean, the size of Lissy's actual ships at this point, so... Yeah, height-wise, they, 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 they have changed over the over the few years, height-wise. Um, so I'm pretty sure, like, Lissy started out as, like, dwarf-sized, and then slowly shrank to, like, <laughs> shorter parrot size. Well, <laughs> When we discussed, like, sort of designing an Ockby, we did actually reskin the dwarf as that's that's kind of what the Ockby is. And yeah, she, she started out being about knee height uh, and has slowly shrunk to puffin size, <laughs> actual puffin size. Um, I think uh, a lot of her motivation and a lot of her story has developed over time around uh, the relationship that she has with the NPC Arlando because it turns out that she left him at the altar and he's a pretty important NPC so we have to have a lot of dealings with <laughs> with with her ex um, and uh, a lot of what drives her is um, this bargain that she made with um, one of the, in 13th age, there are hierarchies, um, and there are certain as aspects, and I've completely forgotten the name, icons, Icon. there are icons, um, and one of which is the lit, is the lich, and the lich has had influence over Lissy as well as Malkesh, um, and her ability to put souls into very tiny ships is uh, one of the abilities that he's given her in order to complete her mission, which is to collect all the prophecy shards. Yay! Those things. And um, the world. So that pretty much segues over to Ferris! Oh, okay. Ferris! <laughs> um, prophecy stones! Yeah, so Ferris came to be because... Um... I guess it was like Mother's Day weekend, if I remember correctly, and I didn't have anything going on, and Dan still wanted to run a session. And so it was myself, um, Dan, or Jay, you were playing Fenrir, Ferris's yeah. brother, who was, who were both uh, siblings to Fizz Finnegan, who everybody knows and loves, the very eccentric wizardling brother. Um... Uh, and then, you, mean, you mean Fizz Finnegan, Master of All Magic. And Fizz, yeah, awesome answer, yes. Um, <laughs> and, then, um, and also Nick, who was playing Lissy, and then uh, Rosie, who was playing uh, Lily, the the glitter barian. <laughs> the Axe Princess. <laughs> the Axe Princess, that's the word, yes. Um, but yeah, I had 
I literally every single time I played a tabletop game that wasn't Call of Cthulhu, I always played a fighter. So I, I didn't branch out too much. I played a rogue because I was allowed to get away with it at that time. <laughs> and then um, after that side session, Dan approached me and said, "Hey, do you want to be, a, you know, a permanent part of the group?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'll take a look into it." Uh, you have a lot. We have a lot of rogues though, so you might have to change things a little bit. I think if if I remember this correctly, both Jay and Dan came up with a plan to have me branch out and, and be the first multi-class character into rogue wizard which was someone to test it out which yeah which <laughs> no, which was a, which was a double whammy because i had never played a, a spell casting character ever before in any tabletop game um and now like as time has gone on ferris has really spent most of his time spell casting very little of his time actually doing his rogue rogue thing um I think a lot of that has to do with his character growth in general. Ferris was his his character arc is or his big character arc anyway. A side story session was just recently completed in Grand Adostrum. Um, but he was from a line of very successful wizards. His father was on the council, Faustus Finnegan, and um, Ferris screwed up. He screwed up real bad. He might have killed a really young aspiring wizard in a show of arrogance and then uh, um, as a result kind of just left he was kind of bailed his family's reputation was more or less ruined um, and he basically fell into a life of crime and that's when he kind of reunited with his brother Fenrir who was Jay's temporary one shot character uh, who was a pirate and that's when they got a tip on a huge score on a prophecy shard. Well, they weren't really told exactly what it was. Lissy was very vague about it. She just said they would get a lot of money. And then... Uh, Which actually you've never seen, have you? No, we never got any money. <laughs> I lost... Uh, Finra died, so... It's not oh, all right, okay, all right. <laughs> um, but yeah, then... Uh, ever since then, Ferris has found that he is... Um, descended from one of the sisters of the Oracle, who is um, basically the one, the um, elf who was able to wield the Orb of Prophecy before it shattered, and she was able to see into the future and help the Empire gain its vast strength, up until the point she saw the too far and went insane and joined forces with the demons to destroy the entire world. Um, and as a result, the um, Orb of Prophecy shattered, and ever since then, Ferris has been kind of drawn to help reunite these shards, because due to his bloodline, he's one of the few people who can actually combine them. Uh, he's he's had a lot of changes over the, over the past two years, which is crazy to think it's been two years. Uh, he initially started off as kind of like a philanderer, rogue, inter interested only in money, and has kind of grown quite a bit uh, more family oriented, more interested in protecting his younger brother, Fizz. And actually, as as after this most recent arc, he's actually really more interested in in magic in general, whereas before he had kind of abandoned that that way of life. And he's finally found a way to keep himself from being subtly corrupted by these prophecy shards, at least for the time being. I don't really know what else to say about Ferris. He's a cool guy. He, he, he has this gauntlet. He has, yes, yes. His gauntlet, which was two gauntlets at one point, and then Lissy decided to upgrade it and also curse it by fusing it with one of the Shards of Prophecy. Yep. And uh, then Hun Hao's been teaching him how to meditate. Right. Yep. Yes. My favorite, yes. about, Air my favorite thing about Han Hao is that Meditate. even though Han Hao is like several hundred years older than Ferris, Ferris still treats him like a little brother. <laughs> and it works, because Han Hao is genuinely naive in a lot of aspects. But we'll get to that in, uh, in a little bit. Yes. Kellen. Tell us about oh Han Hao. Tell us, tell us about the original. The original what? <laughs> <laughs> She's been she's been around the longest. Yeah, I guess that's fair out of this group. She is technically the oldest party member, not in age, but in 
terms of being part of the party. Oh man, I don't even know where to start on this stuff. Um, uh, so I guess just to kind of recap the short list of things up to this point. Um, she initially joined with the, the original party uh, as part of the partners, being kind of a group of... Uh, they still dwarves? I think, no, I guess they weren't dwarves. I think they're like goblins. I think the dwarves and the goblins have formed a collective, which has turned into yes, the, the partners. Yeah, but she was she initially joined them in search of uh, one of her parents who went missing, her mother in particular, uh, who just kind of abandoned her home settlement in the middle of the night and left her with a lot of questions. And it kind of took her to the settlement that we never actually named and. <laughs> and beyond. Uh, but I suppose her original purpose was she felt that there was a kind of inherent worth to... She always saw herself as Dragonic despite her unusual, absolutely not Dragonic appearance. Uh, so she kind of wanted to prove like the... prove herself and her worth and the worth of her race as she felt, you know, she knew the history of Dragonic kind of being a kind of being a weaponized race in the past, like not really given their own agency so much as being used for the express purpose of combat. But as time went on, that kind of gave way to the current state of things. As she's kind of discovered that there's a lot more to what she is. And what that might mean for the world in general. Danger. I'm not good at this. Uh. You're doing fine. Um, you've uh, you you're kind of the heart and soul of the company, aren't you? I guess. <laughs> the, the the moral moral compass, because Gunhill tries to uh, get things. She tries to keep us in line as far as. How deviant we get. Yeah, she tries. She has her own code of doing things, I suppose. So she's. She feels that it's. Uh, she has a certain moral obligation to try to. Try to keep. Try to keep people in line and try to keep things. She, she's very. Her thing has always been that she always kind of sees herself as this very heroic kind of character. Not character, but person in, in, in the in-world sense. Um, so she kind of wants to hold the rest of the group to that, even if it... Maybe she feels it maybe doesn't always win her a lot of favor and likability. Well, we did, we did have to make her a cake because she was very disappointed in us. <laughs> Sorry for putting you in this, uh, what was it, moral quandary? Yes. I think that was it. Yes. And you know, she's she's almost she's almost turning it's interesting to me because she's almost turning into this like mother like character. Uh looking out for looking out for everybody and, and questioning sort of why we have to do sort of certain things and uh to the point, to the point where we feel like we do need to make an apology cake because <laughs> the, the problems that we create are usually ten times worse than uh, than than it, it would have been a lot better to go Gunhild's way than to than to try and uh, well to to basically annihilate our way through most places. She won't be from being a very kind of naive character who doesn't really understand a lot about the outside world because of the very protective village that she was raised in possibly because of these potentially horrible things that she's learning about now um but yeah it's it's kind of changed her perspective and her character from just being very accepting and just like oh that's how that works to more like 
questioning a lot of things and like what the party's motives are and like if she should go along with the party or she should try to do something to try to change the way they're handling things because she wants to wants to work with them but she also doesn't want them to be horrible evil people <laughs> that in her from her perspective excellent and she kind of wants to, she she wants their collective legacy to be remembered as a good one not as the people who just went around wrecking things as opposed to fixing things in their wake <laughs> Well, we, we do tend to fix things after we wreck them. We, we, we have been known to stay behind and, and fix a few things, like the she's, entire mage city. Yeah, she's in a weird spot just because she has to kind of decide like what her motives are and you know, what ends justify what means as a result. Yeah, okay. if that means, means, and if that means getting your hands dirty, or if that means just trying to stay as clean as possible. I hope she does. I hope I hope she manages it. We shall see. Um, I think and that that kind of brings us around to our our most sweet baby angel innocent party member. <laughs> I think it's hilarious that he's the sweetest character and he runs around cutting people up with a makahuitl. <laughs> <laughs> And has two children, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and is like has weird flower powers to turn horrifying monstrosities into horrifying plant monstrosities. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure why Hun Hao is like trees is like the most innocent, kindest character of all of the group. He's just naive about the surface world. You know, really, that's what it comes down to. No, Hun Hao's a big old nerd, though. I mean, have you not noticed how much he reads? He's a big old wood elf nerd. Just like reading. Exactly. But no, Hun Hao is the most recent addition to the party. He is, mechanically speaking, a wood elf occultist, which is this interesting hybrid class of melee fighter and spellcaster, where you cast spells on everybody's turn except your own. It's led to some very interesting situations where Dan is narrating the consequence of an enemy in combat and I just say, Nope, I have a spell for that. And I completely proceed to com undo everything he was narrating because... Game mechanics. <laughs> um, but in character, Hun Hao is a... Uh, he is the only member of his particular tribe of Wood Elves to have left their home on the World Tree, which is, since this is a floating continent above the rotten world of demons, the World Tree is a gigantic tree that reaches even taller than the continent, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, out in the uh, great... O it's, not an o it's not an ocean, it's the Great Sky Sea or something like that. Yep, that's yep. it. Yeah, that's yep. it. Yep. Great Sky Sea. Uh, but long story short, long time ago when the elves first made their exodus from this ruined demon world, um, Hun Hao's tribe of people were left behind as a rear guard to make sure that the demons couldn't pursue them further up the tree. And it was kind of a suicidal mission to hold the trunk and hold back this uh, never ending tide of demons. But they succeeded. They actually dug in, more or less, and have been holding their line against the demons from the world below for, I don't know, forever, basically. And Hun Hao is the only one who's actually left there, the tree. He has left following a, um, a vision from the world tree that he could actually put an, a, a stop to the demons once and for all. And in pursuit of that, he kind of just happened across the party, and they were like, well, there's this uh, naive uh, wood elf who's got a really big wooden sword. Let's adopt him. And that he's kind of stayed ever since. We adopt pretty much every character we run into, honestly. Yeah, PC yeah. or NPC. They're yeah, all pretty much. Yeah. Doubly so if they try and kill us first. I mean... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Who's yeah. who's the uh I can't remember his name, the Dragonic Mage type. Eric. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, he actually right. came back to help us at least. Well, not help us in that moment, but he was, he was he was a boon to our efforts. Have we come across anyone that tried to kill us that we did not kill? That we didn't kind of end up being somewhat friendly with later? Are we still starving your friend in the boat? Yeah, but I've starving. been feeding him. He's there. And I have a plan to talk to him. <laughs> He's Sorry. surviving on instant cake. Oh, yeah. God. No, I mean, at, at some point, I'm going to have to go down and be like, dude, dude, you're still a knot. My knots aren't that good. Why are you lying? <laughs> I think uh, just to just to for Hunhow for just a second, it, yes. it, he has he seems to have a, a quite a a way with uh, demons as well. Is that is that correct? Yes, actually, the way it kind of works in universe is that his magic more or less comes from the world tree, and the thing about a tree that reaches up towards heaven, it's got roots in hell which, quite literally, this tree is growing from the blasted hellscape that the demons invaded. So that awful, rotten earth is what the world tree goes and, through its roots, more or less purifies into life. But that's also the source of Hunhau's magic. So, in a way, his magic is like demonic photosynthesis, where you take this evil energy and turn it into something good. Although the results aren't always pretty, like that time I turned a guy into a rose bush, but um, that's more or less how his magic works. He's actually very familiar with demonic magic, and he uses it by basically, through arcane processes, turning it good. Well, turning it not satanic, evil, chaos. Something a bit more organic. Yeah, basically. Free range. Free range free, magic. Free range magic. demons. Free range uh, GMO free, <laughs> gluten free, vegan magic. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> right. Uh, Eva, hello. You, you, you've made it, which I'm quite pleased about. Hi. Uh, and you've made it just in time. You're, we're still on the first question, so... Uh, tell us about your character, um, sort of, you know, whatever, whatever you'd like to, to mention to anybody. This is where I'm like, so she likes long walks on, walks on the beach, romantic dinners. Former and, companion. Uh, former companion, yeah. Um, no, Nas's question mark. Um, so I actually started, I'm not quite white with the original group, but basically the original group. Like, I think I was a few sessions after. Pretty early on. Yeah, Went to, like, like, a city. That's when you showed up. Yeah, I was I was there for the beginnings of the settlement that never got a name. Um, like, that's kind of where she started with all of this. She was sent on a political mission to try and smooth things over in the middle of nowhere. Uh, which she was pretty grumpy about at the time. Uh, and since then, wandering around has come back to find that uh, her employer of sorts, which is actually uh, her family, they call themselves a family, but it is basically a family that, that took her in when she was young enough and, you know, taught her valuable life skills, like how to quietly stab someone, or how to shoot someone from really far away, how to quickly and quietly scale a building. You know, important life skills. I've always found it interesting because like, I think, I think you might have been the first person to talk to Dan about breaking sort of outside the stereotypes in the 13th age books um, character wise because he wanted to be more of a, a spy rather than a rather than just a just an assassin which we probably had about five assassins at the time 
Yeah, I, I, I could have really easily just been another rogue. <laughs> but I, I kind of wanted rogue flavored, which ended up getting dropped later mechanically. But uh, storyline wise, um, it fit better with Ranger for a time. But the big thing with Ranger in, in, in this game and in many role-playing games, any sort of settings, is the Rangers kind of tend to be the hippies. You know, like, oh no, I'm getting my power entirely from nature and nothing man-made. As soon as there's anything like a cobblestone road or pavements, I just, I can't deal with this. I need trees everywhere in order to do anything. And I said, fuck that. Uh, so I specifically went for an urban-oriented ranger, which worked out well in a campaign called Voices in the Wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I do think that Dan's making up for the fact that most of us have ended up being city folk. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well... It's been easier in terms of, of really quickly having a place to go, I guess. You know, like, oh no, you must travel to the next town. Let's make the next town actually really awesome. Instead of settlement that's unnamed in the middle of nowhere. She's, um, she's recently gone through another change as well, hasn't she? Yes, you see, when you reach a certain age, sometimes your body will go through a change. <laughs> sometimes you'll turn into a chinchilla. Now, you're, the, the important thing is not to panic. <laughs> um, yes, as sort of, ra rather than rolling an entirely new character, uh, like, and coming out with something new, like Lissy, Dan, let me essentially change my class completely. Uh, and so I went from Ranger, which, like I said, had, had fit all right for a time, to a Shifter. Which also suffers from a bit of that hippiness. Like, if you were going to stick to canon lies with the bride powers from nature and turning into different animals, which is what I went with. Um, and so it's been a pretty big reskin instead of animals. It is instead different forms that are modeled after sort of like face cards. Like I don't want to say Major Arcana of a tarot deck exactly because it's not a perfect match that way. But it is card character like, let's say. Although for a scout form that is still various small animals that can't really do too much damage. Like a chinchilla. <laughs> Why the hell did I say chinchilla? Why? <laughs> that was great. That was wonderful. I like I like that it comes from a different source other than sort of your your stereotypical shifter well we already have one you know tree hugger in the group whoa now <laughs> whoa now <laughs> i'm pretty sure hunhouse is pretty tall but he couldn't fit his arms around the world he just tree. lived in the tree <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure, sure if that's worse. I'm sure he's hugged like a branch or two. You know? Yeah, probably a branch or two. Yeah, I'm not saying the entire tree. Everyone goes through that experimental phase. I think it's funny that everybody picks on Hunhao for being a tree hugger, when really they should be picking on him for being a communist. Because <laughs> there was that whole part in Grand Nadastrum where he was like, look at all this fucking opulence when you could be like solving world, world hunger. Why would you live in a house this big? It makes no sense, sense to me. Because it can float. Goddamn <laughs> wizards. <laughs> um, right. Uh, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Speaking of, um, what do you guys think to the environments that we've sort of found ourselves in? Um, 
like you know uh, do you do you prefer going through the urban bits we've not really had quite a lot of like wilderness bits i will say that it's been interesting because i am playing a character that's very much from the wilderness i mean i can't speak for everybody's character but i don't know Granted Ostrom was, well, not Granted Ostrom, uh, what was the city we were in first, where you first met him, um, god, the one that got blown up by Headless Dude. Oh, um, Guildholm? Guildholm? Yeah. Yep. That was the first city he'd ever seen. He had never seen anything like that. So it's been interesting to sort of have this sense of wonderment and awe going through Hunhouse Head as he goes through first Guildholm, and then Granted Ostrom, where everything is opulent and wizardly. It'll actually be an interesting shift, since it seems like next session we are going to be going back into the woods, which is Hunhouse Wheelhouse. He's going to be a lot more comfortable out in the trees. Although you might be confused why they're so small. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to wonder, are there like smaller I trees? Know, like, the tree? Yeah. Or, or, yeah. Do you guys have little gardens on the world tree? How do you eat? Well, I have to imagine they have their own sort of ecosystem on the world tree. Like, there would be animals that live on the world tree for them to eat. As well as, I don't know, like, agriculture on the branches, fruit right, of the I'm world just tree. I'm imagining everything, like, way bigger than it should be, like, a 10-ton apple. Yeah, or, like, it might well be. Or, like, a 40-foot <laughs> squirrel. Like... <laughs> Like James and the Giant Peach here. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind, kind of. of they have to fight. <laughs> I mean, never mind. Jaegers, you have <laughs> and never mind fighting demons all the time. The real problem: woodpeckers. Oh dear God! I was just gonna say, oh man, that's how they've truly become the warriors that they are today. Is from fending off woodpeckers. Woodpeckers and squirrels. Do you feel any different being outside Grand Adostrum, Tyler? Yeah, I mean, Grand Adostrum was definitely Ferris's wheelhouse. Uh, I mean, I, I really did enjoy, like, the Orc Lands campaign, where it was just kind of like everything was foreign, because not a whole lot of people hung out with Orcs. Um, but yeah, really, I guess Ferris has only been around for a couple different scenari uh, yeah, scene scenery, so... But yeah, coming from Grand Adostrum to, I guess, Twin Lakes is where we're at right now. It's still very much the city, but there's less magic-y stuff. I think once we get into the woods, it'll be a little bit different. Is there any place that anybody's actually sort of looking forward to seeing? I will say I was really kind of sad that we didn't stop by Akvi Capital yeah oh uh, and do you know what i've forgotten what it's called it's something because it's on a cliff it's on cliffs yeah yeah and I, it's called something like that and dan's gonna kill me later for forgetting what it is <laughs> is it clifton <laughs> Cl cliffville, cliffville. <laughs> Yes, Clifford, the big red robot. Wait, is that <laughs> where the alternate universe uh, Voices of Wilderness High School is? It's Cliffside High School? Oh, dear oh, God. God. <laughs> That'll be the next campaign. <laughs> oh, Donnie. Oh, God, now it's in my brain. What, the <laughs> high school yeah, alternate just all... AU? Everybody in yeah, high school? It's just... It's just going to be Nos being like, wow, I sure hope Sensei Delilah notices me. <laughs> and Ferris walks around in a yeah. varsity jacket. Yeah. Oh, oh, now he's hosting yoga sessions. He doesn't know what to do. <laughs> he's having yoga sessions out on the uh, football quad. <laughs> Klaus Pet is a chinchilla. Yes, you're right, Darby. <laughs> no! <laughs> It's that uh, little bug that we left back at the settlement. Oh, the fire the bug. Cut. Yeah, that Oh! One. I completely forgot about that. I, I think it's because, again, half the, half the people 
it didn't didn't experience what could be experienced with the. I, 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 I only remember that bug from the uh, the splash screen. Yeah, there was a picture, but I think I missed the introduction of it, and then he kind of stopped being a thing by the time I joined. Yeah, it didn't really get discussed much. Because there's there's anymore. a different wizard in that screen. Yeah, I'm not there's remembering that, yeah. anything about a bug. Rook. That was that was definitely before you came along. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's like, quite a while he was ago. pretty much pretty much mentioned as a joke, I think, or like I'm not sure. I'm not, I think I'm not... it was because before we tried making friends with everybody, we tried to make pets out of all the monsters. Oh, right. Dear God. Right, including zombies. I remember this now. That did not end Even well. When... No. I remember hearing tales of a successful stealth mission that immediately went south. I'm still, I'm still mad about that. <laughs> you mean the stealth mission where we got through the zombies and then, uh, who was it? The puzzle was done pretty much perfectly, and then Templeton had to go get a pet zombie. Yeah, that was it. So we ended up having a combat despite actually avoiding all combat. Nice. Yep. And this is like Templeton was... got hit by a zombie as we ran out the door. This was back when I was trying really, really, really hard to avoid combat. Right, guys. So, um. I've got I've got one for for Dan, who's who's requested this, and then I think we'll go to Jay's question, uh, because it's getting it's getting to that time. Um, so I would like to know um, everybody's favorite NPC and why. We can start sort of left to right again if you want. Sure, we can. I gotta uh. look at this. <laughs> is, uh. this a, is this a trick question? No, <laughs> yes. no, absolutely. Well, yeah, kind of, but I, totally I don't know a trick question. On the end, I mean, so. for me it is, because I really don't know. <laughs> well, you can More talk of a about it. Hey, person who created all of these NPCs, so, we will tell you which NPCs we don't love as much. Not, not to put any yeah. pressure on you, but he did say he wanted to have that question answered because they're all his babies. Yes, mm. that's pretty much it. <laughs> I feel like my answer is a cop out. Um, I love Ambois, uh, and not just because I intentionally miscalled him Mr. Tibbs for a year. Um, I don't think that's the cop out. <laughs> that's an awesome if anything, if anything it's, it's further cemented by the fact that you called him Mr. Tibbs for a year. I, I found Ambois as a cat skeleton in a safe with a cesium atom. Um, because, of course, Dan had to make a physics joke. <laughs> and uh, the cat came back to life, which was really Malkesh's first understanding that necromancy is kind of a thing. Um, because as much as he said magic was dangerous, the truth is Malkesh really didn't know much about magic, and he was just afraid of things he didn't know. Um, so to really have this kind of thing, say, hey, you can do this, and hey, you know, your surgery skills can actually do this cool stuff. And actually, amusingly, it was the first real touch on grafting, which later became a major plot point in the campaign, though I think that's thoroughly in Gunhilt's wheelhouse at this point. But, um... Yeah, I a lot I, about wheelhouses today. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but, um... <laughs> sorry. that word I, so many I gave, times. From, from, a, from a talking cat, uh, he grew to have wings and then um, claws, and so he went from a little black cat to a little griffin, um, which I'm sure yeah. someone will shoot there with a French name here. <laughs> Le petit griffon. There you go. Um, because the name is French for and and like ambrosia, but yeah. <laughs> but we all call it ambroa, even though. Knowing even just a tiny bit of French makes me want to say Amboise every time. Like, I think I was actually mispronouncing his name for the first little bit. I mean, Amboise, my Ambro, so it works mm -hmm. out. I, I mean, Gunhild was supposed to be pronounced Gunhild, but I mean, I'm I mean, just I taking a moment and playing the fantasy card. 
Gunny. Gunny. Um, oh my god. Second favorite has to be the Lich. I don't know, maybe I oh find a role that uh, the NPC <laughs> I get to play with. Don't steal my NPC, goddammit. <laughs> Uh, I think it's cool that, uh, you know, you only get one, damn see, I get to uh, work with is a friggin' icon. So. I think, is it the only icon we've met? Yes. It is. Yeah. Well, the icon. Well, the we've council, seen, kinda. We've seen the, um, like, the Arch? answering machine message for the Archmage. Mm -hmm. Oh, but, yeah! Oh, now I'm sad. Whoa. Okay, so Archmage. Because that doesn't happen. And then Orc Lord, because we helped that happen. We, we made the Orc Lord, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's kind of cool, because the Lich is kind of like, just do it. And Makesh is like, okay, boss. <laughs> and I really, I, I do, out of character, entirely understand the Lich's motivation. And it's really hard, because Malkesh is painfully honest at times maybe not to the point which is a, a character flaw of his he just kind of dances around the point a lot but he has no hesitation basically saying oh yeah he just wants to kill everything on the world below us like that because Malkesh sees it as a good thing even if it's not necessarily <laughs> um so it's kind of hard to have that conversation, but Malkesh really does honestly feel very strongly that the Lich has the right idea, even if maybe he's not going about it the right way. But then Malkesh feels that about most people, uh, which is kind of amusing. <laughs> yeah, favorite NPC is Embois. Uh Next favorite would be the Lich. Z's would be in there somewhere. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I know, I know I said, I know I said the Lich, because I was mostly joking, but he's probably my second as well, um, and, but my first has always been Orlando, um, simply because he's kind of the one that I based my character around, and has influenced a lot of who Lissy is, um, for better or for worse, uh, because she does have a lot of sort of ulterior motives and they don't always match up with what happens so she has to try and scramble and recover uh, all while trying not to damage further a relationship that she's already pretty damaged um, and sometimes that's hard because uh, the character that I love the most I can't talk to in character because he hates my guts. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Orlando has always been since he turned up with his, his sort of. He wears a he wears a Hawaiian shirt and he builds giant robots. And I'm sorry, I I fell in love. And and that's my favorite NPC. Oh, I guess it's my turn now. Yes! Um, oh. <laughs> I mean, the cop-out answer would be Fizz. Fizz Finnegan's great. Um, Fizz but, Finnegan uh, is great. Fizz Finnegan, master of all that. They're, they're, Which is hilarious. There are lots to choose from. I mean, Zell is pretty neat as far as, you know, this random nerdy orc that somehow became the orc lord. Um, Casey, who just kind of came out of nowhere. Um, who is also related to Fizz in some way, or Ferris. And, um... Even... Oh, I cannot remember this guy's... I, I feel bad not remembering this guy's name. The, the the man that we got decapitated. He was a pirate. Why am I blanking on his name? Anybody? Bueller? I'm bad, because I can't remember the one that's the grafting. There's the guy that's just turned up, and finished off the sea captain and again I'm, I'm, Zexel. I'm so bad is that Zexel yes. yeah Zexel was the one who decapitated the, the pirate captain I cannot feel like I can even remember his name we'll have to get down I can't to, remember it'll, to it'll, make a list it'll come to me is I, that, it's on the actually there should be an NPC list in the in World 20 I don't know if there was ever a 
Clearly, he's our favorite. Name I mean, is he because I thought, I thought he was just going to be ignored, like, after he got decapitated, but he keeps coming back? Yeah! He is yeah. not in the NPC garage, though. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's not. not. And thus doesn't count. We don't have to feel bad. <laughs> We don't have to make a cake for that one. I mean, it's been like a no. year since we saw him last, at least, so. <laughs> Stop giving Dan ideas. This is true, um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I mean, honestly, coming back to it, it would it would have to be Fizz. Fizz was the whole reason Ferris existed in the first place when Jade said, hey, you know it would be funny if Fizz had brothers? <laughs> Which is just extra hilarious because Fizz basically, if I remember correctly, um, because I actually missed the session where he was first introduced. Um, That's a he, great session. He, he basically was born out of Dan's desire to annoy the shit out of all of us. Yeah. He and really wanted to make I went back to that session. <laughs> and it sounds like Jay had a hand in creating Fizz Finnegan Master of All Magic. I did not. Oh, you did not? <laughs> did not. I mean, not uh, that I think, any of us reaction to Fizz Finnegan, Master of All Magic, just... Yeah, well, just so, like, Fizz preempt. Finnegan was a little too close to Jim Wizardo. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it wasn't that long after Jim Wizardo. Rest in peace. Uh, you rip. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim Wizardo was more, like, <laughs> desperate for attention, and Fizz just imagined he had all the attention anyway. Yes. But he was a big magic user at a time when Malkesh was super anti-magic. Like, the way people, some people are anti-vaccination, he was anti-magic. <laughs> and for the same deluded thoughts, too. <laughs> Helen? Have you thought of someone? Uh... Oh well. <laughs> um, I feel like I just I always have like a really bad problem with like trying to remember who all the NPCs are to begin with, so Well um and what about um what about Mort? Oh everybody loves Mort. I was gonna Probably. say Mort And you can have Mort that's fine. <laughs> But I'm not like still another two people, so I'm pretty more more and Oker are always good good selections. Mm -hmm. Um and then there's Gunhild's dad as well. Yeah, that's kinda of who I was thinking of just because that was kinda of like a blind side of an event. Generally, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean I feel like saying that is just like trying to win over Dan's good favor just because like he did such a good job with the character. Uh, no, nah, not real. I mean, you, you look, you know, I suffer from the same thing in that if there ends up being so many characters, unless they fall within the realm of my goals, um, I have trouble remembering Headless Pirate. Um, and I think I think that's something that everybody kind of suffers from. It's not it's not like we're doing this on a daily basis either. Yeah. I'd say it would probably be Calderac then, just because it was kind of like a crucial turning point for the character, because she was very much not sure of, like, what she was supposed to be doing at that point, and kind of having that, like, guidance in terms of, you know, letting... Because he was kind of the one who pointed her towards, like, hey, you can, you know, if you go... Depending on where you go, you'll probably find out more about yourself. Uh, so I think that was just kind of like a crucial point for her to kind of... I mean, she had already put together the pieces of kind of her own past, or at least what she knew about it, and that obviously most of what she had grown up knowing was just a complete fabrication. But I think having someone involved in that that like was honest about saying, you know, I don't have the answers for you, but here's what you can do to try to find out. I think that was a good turning point for Gunhild as a character, so... I Anything also like that he's, he's this just great big brash, uh, loud sort of. He's he's really he takes up space, doesn't he? 
That seems to be the case. Like, they, uh, again, just Dan did a good job of kind of like running with the very limited description that I had had in mind for the character. And just kind of taking that and running with it and making something out of it, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to see more of them at some point, but that's just me hoping to well, have that politics. familiarity again. Yeah. That's all in the political realm, which is now currently behind us. But uh, I guess if we're going like first and second. Sure works. Oh, that's like that Zeke. guy's name. Oh, right. yeah. Hey. yeah. <laughs> well done. I think uh, in terms of like a second character, I think Casey's probably kind of like a second selection just because she falls into that like, oh, well, you know, static evil character. And then like, you know, not not necessarily in presentation, but like according to the way the party kind of viewed her and her actions and just recently finding out, you know, finding out that for, you know, Gunhild as a character, at least having someone else who's like, in that kind of space of, well, what exactly am I? Am I? What was I? You know, I'm not any of these things that I thought I was. So, what am I here for? And like, what was what purpose was I created for? Is kind of a similarity that she can get behind, even if she doesn't necessarily agree with uh, with uh, Casey's actions. I, don't know. I wouldn't I say that Nas. Caesar is, is evil or did she? Yeah, I'm pretty sure she's been trying to tap that since day one. <laughs> Her <laughs> methods are a bit uh, questionable. Which one are you talking about? Because well, you're right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, was just a, that was just a blanket statement for every woman that we've met that's an NPC. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> maybe, okay, maybe that's right. something that we need to bring up with Dan is that he plays these questionable women. I think poor, poor Delilah. I mean, I think even Carnifex was was in on that. And for <laughs> we look at some character that's not. Although nobody's really interested in Florentine, everybody wants to kind of kill Florentine or betray her. I know, no. but out of character, I love her. Doesn't Florentine like the NPC thing? Just oh, there she is. Yeah, she's, she's very she's prone there somewhere. I do like Florentine, but I, I think character-wise, it's like she doesn't. Oh no, we can't be know friends. About her. We've, we've not <laughs> met. We've not met her enough. She's she's too mean. Exactly. That's kind of why I love her. Like. I don't I just know. Hate the fact that we exist. I think like. Ferris's biggest gripe with Florentine is that she's basically ended up as like that person in a group project that takes all the credit, even though they didn't do more than half the work. <laughs> uh, yeah. Where she kind of sees it like, uh, why do I have to do all of the work? Yeah. And that's how she acts to everybody. She's actually super bitchy, and I love it. But is she your favorite? Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't say that, no. I think... Well, it's kind of a toss-up for, for serious love of characters. I think between um, Ambula, just because of having that there and where that's led us and how that all started. Um, it started as a, a physics joke. And then at some point, I think I jokingly said, ha, huh, what if Nas's grandfather, quote, because uh, family hierarchy of this, this uh, huge sprawling spy network is kind of given in terms of uh, relations. So the founding grandfather would be the highest up and he's been missing for forever. And I said, ah, wouldn't it be funny if it was actually Ambra? And of course Dan just went with it. Right? Because why not? Because of course. 
Uh, but that's interesting because, like, for everybody else, Amb was just a kitty cat. But for Nass, it's a, it, he's actually something significant. It, well, more significant than he has been. He's kind of been a liaison for Lissy and uh, Malkesh uh, to a certain degree, but but certainly not with the sort of connections that he has to Nass. That's true. Like, yeah. Nothing I mean, about anything okay. she's done, done in her life would be there if not for what he had started. And he was kind of your sort of worthless. companion. Um, not that kind of companion. But ah, no. Or... No one is that kind of companion <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> uh, more of a... Uh, as part of your class, he was... Yes, so the, uh, he that. was the... Yeah, animal companion, or I guess the... the Anywhere else it would pop up as familiar. Right. Oh, oh, right. I hadn't finished. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Between him and then and then Brixis, just because of all of the delicious heartache that ended up being revealed. At the uh, end of the Stranded Ostrom bit, with you and like with Lucy and Orlando and and Rexus. Puffin drama coming to a theater near you. Yes. Yeah, and how it all started with the like, here is the evil bad wizard character trying to kill you, and then of course we come back and like, here is the not exactly black and white character with different motivations and. Well, shit. I think Dan put me on the spot and was like, "So, what's or what's Orlando to you?" And I basically said, "Well, I left him at the altar." Just amazing. And that's <laughs> and that's how that began. Yeah. I like how that that is what led to mine. Not like, oh, we're cousins or we used to work together. Just straight for it. I left him at the altar. <laughs> I devastated his little puffiny heart. Ah. Um, his liver was another case. Yeah, well, he devastated that himself. <laughs> but then also just the fun characters, like I love Mort, and I'm super happy that Dwayne came back. <laughs> <laughs> and by Dwayne, I, about I mean that. Wayne. <laughs> Which, where, where did Dwayne orig originate from? Uh, Wayne, I want to say Orc. Not I think quite. it was around the Orclands time. But not I quite. Well, no, I, was, I wasn't around I, when. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a bit before then. We kind of right after the settlement, we were going to basically a thieves town. Or it could, it was it was a temporary thing though. Or the bandit leaders were getting together and oh that's right yeah i just remember because we made a few friends and then we pissed off some more people it was very politicky which is surprising given that it was a town of thieves and scoundrels and we charmed our way through it but one of the characters there was a big burly man named Wayne. And was that joke him. was born. He was he was not at all like rock. Definitely not. Dwayne the Boulder. The Boulder. <laughs> that That's was, it. was Dwayne the Boulder. Was it the Boulder? I have no idea. I just threw that out there. <laughs> right. Hunhow. Tyler. Right. Oh, uh, well, my favorite NPC is going to be a brief answer. Mort, he's fucking adorable. Right. Love him. <laughs> it's a good choice. Well made. Yeah. Like a fine wine. Mm. All there is I to love... it. Really enjoy I Mort. Think we all love Mort. Mm. Yeah. He's I definitely my favorite. Mort is like, Mort is the uh, get out of jail free card. 
he might help you out of jail if you ask nicely. <laughs> he he just be hey bud. Be like yeah. hey, hey bud hey, yeah. Oh, hey, bud. What's the problem with the oh, jail there? These parts sure do look strong, but I think I might be able to hook you up with something. <laughs> when he it's when he swears <laughs> as more as well. <laughs> I've missed the swearing. <laughs> oh god, I'm gonna have to go back and listen now. I like the casual swearing. It is. It's the casual swearing. I'm sure it. I'm sure. I'm sure he says it. Cause the only thing that's leaping to mind it would be a bad impression of like Jesus bye. But I don't think that happened. <laughs> no. Right. I think that brings us round to Jay's question, which was incredibly good. And typically, he's probably gone to go eat dinner. No, I'm right here. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you wanted me to say it or if you wanted no, to take it. I'd like, I'd like right you to it. say it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the question is, since uh, 13th Age is a 10-level system versus... Uh, Pathfinder D&D &D, the 20 levels. Um, the campaign is kind of coming to a close soonish. <laughs> Not immediately. We still have two levels, two and some two and some change levels to go. But assuming the campaign when the campaign ends that Dan runs another campaign or someone else takes up the mantle to continue the story, what would your next character be? If it were in the same setting? Not necessarily. Just, I mean, in 13th Age in general. Because I still have another character I've never well, gotten to play. Do. <laughs> you sure do. But, I mean, beyond that, beyond characters you've played, this has to be something you've not gotten to use, so not a character that's already been in. And but, luckily, you're towards the end, so you got plenty of time to think about it. And it doesn't have to be specific, but, like, but like class. Why don't, why don't you answer your question first, Jay? I can, because I started thinking about this the other day because it sounded like fun. I would love to do like a Victorian era themed fencer and use the Ooh, monk that'd class. Be cool. Oh yeah, we've Ooh. talked about this, yeah. Oh my god! And uh, because it has different flowing attacks, which would make it a little more dynamic than just a fighter. Um, and it's got key based powers. And I'd also like to play a person that's above three foot tall again. And um, <laughs> what yeah. we all. Um, hey, you're the one who keeps shrinking yourself. <laughs> uh, I think that's Nick's yeah. fault, really. I think monk would be a fun class, and I think combined with like so that fencer kind of gentleman that you know I'm thinking like British curly mustache, you know metal yeah. you know cuirass kind of armor. Um, as a fencing character, I think would be cool. Play a little more of a hero character, less of an asshole. Would be nice. Yeah. Well, I've actually... I, I think I know what I want to play next. Well, it's not your turn. Oh, no, well, no, fuck okay. you then. No, let, let yeah. It's yeah. alright, it's okay. Okay, hold on. <laughs> this is your turn, then. I'll, I'll allow so much it. from the left to right. <laughs> Only because the puffin allows it. There you go. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Well, you remember when we were talking Adderjaeger originally, I wanted to play a Landsknecht. But then I got on the idea of playing a Witch Hunter, and that's how uh, Jurgen came about. I think it would be interesting to do something with Bard, where instead of songs to buff up the party, it's literally this guy just yelling orders that inspires everyone. Big drunk German man with a big drunk German man mustache and a big drunk German man sword. Or how had you considered multi-classing that with commander i'll say yeah, yeah. that was that was the other thought was either bard or commander except i really like the idea instead of like barking the orders you think of for someone to just like big burly angry looking man to be like you you look really nice today <laughs> i mean you yeah, look like awesome. you're gonna do great barking <laughs> like drunkenly me. compliments <laughs> <laughs> you have an incredible hat. Oh, he would have an incredible hat. That—that's the other thing. Be... <laughs> he 
he's got to have a big floppy bonnet with like a metal skull cap and like as <laughs> many friends, feathers mate. as possible. I have to I have to throw an idea at you. Oh no. Instead of go through that, go bard, go commander. But what you should do then is have him completely ununderstandable. Like frontier yes. gibberish levels of understandable. <laughs> Just drunkenly slurring things at yep. members of the party and somehow it works. That's actually a great idea. And I see I had a Scottish character who spoke like um what's his name in Brave? You know, yeah, Finn and yes. throw a cover at his head or something like that. That accent. I would I yes. would actually sit down and study that particular Gaelic accent so I could do it when I'm throwing out my orders in character. I'd fucking do it. I think okay. that'd be a good judge. <laughs> Just so everyone knows, usually when you've got things like that, and sorry, this is usually attached to items, so you've got like um a consequence of using a particular item but i think oh, yeah, like a quirk? To, yeah i think i think there ought to be the magic equivalent of captions for <laughs> an, an admirable... yellow text yeah just yeah. yellow text at the bottom of the screen yeah <laughs> it was just, just underneath him at all times can there be like a a pretty easy one a pretty easy role but like some role involved so that every now and then We'll just try and read something and be like, uh, uh, I think someone mistyped that caption. No, just at the Don't bottom, it'll just say unintelligible gibberish. Unintelligible. <laughs> yes, yes, it would just appear as that. Or people would mistranslate it, so it would look like something, that, a rip that's come from, from somewhere else. It's just been translated very badly by Google. At the beginning, it just like, it says who's translating, like the little pop-up in the upper corner. Oh god, now I'm just thinking, rather than... Because you got me talking about an accent that nobody can understand, and my mind naturally jumped to the Scottish Gaelic. I'm thinking Bard Commander with bagpipes. Kilt, oh, big old floppy big old bonnet. So so I've, I've played, in a car played in one very short campaign with a bard that, for funny, for fun, for the lulls, we decided to uh, that he would play bagpipe. It just so happened that during that short campaign, he failed like every single playing role he made with bagpipes. But nobody could tell because bagpipes. Hey, hey. Oh, I hey. love good bagpipes. I can tell because I'm from New Scotland and I have no choice but to like bagpipes. in the uh, user agreement form for being born here. Right. Has, has anybody else got an idea? I think you and Gunhild are the only people here at the moment. Ellen oh, Nost. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Rosie, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in game mode, I apologize. <laughs> uh, I do actually kind of have an idea of but not necessarily, I don't have a class to match it with, more of the character archetype. Um, I don't want to just default to Rogue, but I've always, always wanted to play the stereotypical gentleman thief character. Sounds fun. Like, actually a thief though, not like the bumbling path towards something somewhat sneaky that I'm playing now. And not even necessarily all that good at sneaking. More gentlemanly than thief. I'm not sure what class to put that with, but I'm now going to have to find out. <laughs> right? <laughs> something... Uh I've put that in all of your heads now, and you will help me think of something. Yes. Is it the Inspector Clouseau class? So you said more gentlemanly, sorry. Also more thief than inspector. But probably <laughs> just as, as French. Like a the Scarlet thief. Pimpernel character? Uh, sort of like Lupin the Third. Oh, yes. <laughs> 
Oh, yes. <laughs> so I love Lupin the Third. My first anime. I loved it. <laughs> the noise you just made. Yeah, that was a little... Uh, that, was well, that was a little sexual. He was into it. <laughs> Lupin the Third is great. I'm sorry. If you haven't I'm seen it, you're right. denying not... yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Anything kind of like Arsene Lupin related? I'll tell you what I'd like to do, if mm -hmm. that's okay. Yeah, you, I, no, I'd go away. We love you. Sorry. <laughs> Please tell us. I want to play um, a fallen icon. Ooh. Ooh. Which uh, one? one. Uh, well, I mean, my first thought was the Lich, that something would happen to the Lich where he actually becomes a purse, a character again. Mortal. <laughs> Yeah, ba basically. How the Man, Lich Palace would have back. to feel really hard. That would be <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> but whether or not that'd be too... I, you'd have to really sort of work out. Like, you'd basically be running around as, as a god. Which... <laughs> I really get... I mean, it's a lot of work being god and all. <laughs> If it's a puffin, it would would that really be like infinite cosmic power, itty bitty living spaces? <laughs> <laughs> no, no lie. Yeah. Also, no, I want to play like that. I I so, sorry. So probably I probably necromancer out for like a good ten seconds there. I can't even begin to, to think sort of what classes and so I mean, well, no, you'd have to pick a normal class, but you'd have to pick a normal class as someone who used to have infinite power. Uh, I mean, necromancer. Uh, yeah, say, yeah, necromancer would probably be. <laughs> no, no, so, necromancer. So, so many spells. So this is a person that's used to, you, that could probably raise an entire continent full of skeletons that would probably struggle to raise the skeleton of a baby bird that's fallen out of its nest. <laughs> An incompetent necromancer. <laughs> okay, now you're just describing Malkash. <laughs> <laughs> no, Malkash is frighteningly competent. He is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's Little kind of scary. Really. For somebody who didn't really believe in the powers of magic oh, for no. two months ago. Oh no? Jay! The Lich could come back as Bruno. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh, yeah, but the intro would have to be like the MST3K intro. Like, just... <laughs> In the not-so-distant not future. <laughs> like, Mokesh is just cleaning up around the whole thing, and he knocks over the Shards of Prophecy, and like, the Lich goes, no, And he's like, transported <laughs> into Bruno. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> not gonna risk phylactery or whatever. Yes. Shards. Oh, prophecy. Hi. Terrible coffee. These are the things that the Lich King was. That was the sound of me being dead. Okay. Alright. So we've got Tyler and Kellen. I guess I'll go. Um. <sighs> Excuse me. Uh, so I had like two ideas that kind of came up during the course of the campaign. Like if ever, the first was like if ever need, and this was before like Calderac really showed up. But like the first thought was like if something did happen to Gunhill, like my thought was like it kind of like changed into like the concept for like a summoner kind of character, but in the sense that they only summon for like a very short time so like for special attacks or whatever you want to call it like so like all their you know particular skills would be like summoning a specific spirit to do that skill or ancestor to do that skill um so how really large like would the horn on their head be <laughs> good question would it just be a hat i think it would have to be a hat so that you can take it off at night Okay. Would the male and female versions have different outfits? Is this like a Final Fantasy thing? Um, that's definitely where I'm going to <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was a Persona reference, sorry. 
I mean, it could be either at this point. It's hard to tell these days. Uh, but the other the other fun thought, I, more interesting, more fun thought I had would be like a traveling wrestling character. Uh, so probably like a reskinned monk or maybe another kind of hybrid fighter class. But problem is I don't know like a huge like wealth of wrestling moves. So I have to like research stuff to like make it sound more interesting. Uh, but I kind of like the idea of just like this masked wrestler, like or luchador wrestler that just like goes around and helps, like joins a group for like whatever backstory I end up coming up with for that. But like they're just constantly in character the whole time. <laughs> Those are kind of my ideas. Like, I haven't really like spent a lot of time thinking about it beyond that, but those are my my ideas. If you ever do a one-off, I could try the wrestling character concept, maybe. Well, oh, another one-off. One I, I want to play Lily again! Maybe one day, if I get brave enough. <laughs> or me. Or... Wait, can we, like, can we Cody on something? Is that possible? <laughs> like tag in and out, depending on which character we want to play. <laughs> with our powers combined, I'm sure we can come up with something. Because I kind of want to DM, but I'm also a chicken. I I am scared to do voices. Like, oh, that's, that's the thing I'm most cool. excited to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we may have found the co DM group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's about the perfect combination then. You got chocolate think... in my peanut butter. I, I can handle all the rule stuff, but. <laughs> Oh, see, who cares about rules? I just want to make funny voices. <laughs> um, I think that's actually kind of what I regret of the most with, with Nas, is not really coming up with anything specific. And so to listen to me describe where it's not really all that interesting, I don't find. But Maybe I'm just comparing that to Mort. This is a fairly high bar. Yeah, Mort's a pretty high bar there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess if I, if I were to create a different character or start a new one, if, if somehow I don't end up DMing at some point in my life. Um, we'll get would, there would, someday. Yeah, maybe one day. I don't think I could do a full campaign. That would be way too much stress. Yeah. Um, but I think I've always loved the idea of like an atheist cleric who like hoard himself out to like the like whatever God happened to be listening. Oh, at the yes. time. See, now would that be atheist or agnostic? I guess, I guess yeah, agnostic. I don't know, like <laughs> probably agnostic, I guess. I'm kind of joking, but yeah, I guess technically that would be more agnostic. Like just, like just which, whichever God happened to be more relevant at the time. And just see what happened. Either that or like a cleric who fell out of favor with his particular deity and was in the process of shopping around for a new god. That just reminds me of um Benny from the uh the mummy movie. When he gets fucking cornered by the mummy and he just yes. starts pulling out religious symbols and yes. seeing which one works. <laughs> you guy. came back from the desert with a new friend, didn't you, Benny? Either that or, like, it would be a commander skinned as a cleric who fell out of favor with his god. Like, it turns out he's just really good at, at inspiring people, but he thinks it's some random deity, but he can't quite pin it down as to who. And the power was inside himself all along. <laughs> and when you think about it, isn't that really god? Depends who you're asking. Yeah. Also, Chaos Mage is one of those things where, on paper, it looks terrifying to actually dive into, but it's really kind of a neat mechanic. Yeah, it'd be one of those yeah. things, once you got it down, it'd be really freaking cool, but the learning curve would be a huge pain in the ass. All right. Well, like, I nothing really idea. in your... Like, you don't really have a say in it. Like, you just kind of roll the yeah. dice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Going along with that idea, I have something that I think would work out for you. You don't know who it is. It turns out you've unfortunately aligned yourself with a trickster god, and every time you invoke something, it it's different. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Ooh. Yeah. So he'll never identify himself because it's more funny to him or her 
that they don't. Yeah. <laughs> so you're just literally stuck struggling. Jesus Christ, this poor no cleric, his happen. whole religious identity is one big fucking joke. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But is he in on it? No. <laughs> For some no. reason I can't turn undead, but I can change my gender at will. <laughs> is it really at will? Is it? At will in quotations. T technically, yes. <laughs> We splash him with cold water. Like, well, I oh mean, it's God. a quick action. <laughs> I just want to point out that, that the Chaos Mage has a spell just called Blarg. <laughs> That's a good spell. Ooh, Wibble. It's I'm pretty not good. seeing the downside here. Yeah. <laughs> right, guys. I think that might be a wrap because it's 20 to 1 here. Oof. Oh. Yeah, here and later, I've already turned into a pumpkin, so <laughs> oh, God. I have to deal with that in the morning. <laughs> um, you're was there you're really, that... really lively for a pumpkin. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. Awesome job. That's what the that's what the fairy told me when she told me it turned me into a person. <laughs> so, like, is there anything that you guys wanted to say in sort of wrap up or? Get a round of applause for a puffin of ceremonies. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta hold down my push to talk, so I'm just yeah. clapping against my chest. Don't <laughs> <laughs> hurt yourself. Oh. Uh, Dan just joined. <laughs> oh no. Oh, oh shit, goodbye, Dan. Dan. Oh. Now you're just gonna have to listen. Just, just, just in time. Just in time for us to rip. <laughs> I would I would like to thank Dan for running a very uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah let's all thank like Dan oh awkward chest clapping to Dan yeah more <laughs> clapping I don't think that carries through oh my microphone at all awkward. I have no idea if you can hear the golf clapping but we all drew yeah, straws and decided that I was going to be the DM from now on so you need to make a character <laughs> true talk who's running the next one shot. Not it. Rock, I ran paper, the scissors. last one shot. Um, <laughs> I'm not opposed to it. It's a thing. Like, like I would, I'd love to try it, I but I have no should. idea what I'm doing. Well, that's okay, because there are actually people that do know what they're doing. They're like like at, the, at the same time, it's like I want, I want to run things by the very experienced people that are here, but I also don't want to ruin surprises for them. Yeah. Okay, well, 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 yeah, figure it out in post. <laughs> yeah, I'm Good not life. gonna lie, I just want to come up with some excuse to bring Lily back. I really, really like Lily. Well, I think the advantage in which, in which case, I should, I should probably try coming up with something in that case. Then, well, I think the advantage of a one shot is that we can place it anywhere, exactly, at any level, at any <laughs> it time, it doesn't have to be these characters. <laughs> Yeah, it could be the people that we talked about today that we'd probably use after the yeah. campaign. I I've already I already made that character, so. You <laughs> oh, good lord. So Jay's ready for the one shot, everybody. Yeah, um, I've got my character. I, I mean, I would probably want to put a one shot if I made it, like, somewhere around, you know, fourth or fifth level where you get some of the more fun spells and abilities. Yeah. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. First level is pretty pretty quiet Blah. well the, the whole point of 13th age is yeah your your first level should be done after like the first encounter so yeah we're i'm good for that just yeah i think we're all ready oh. to go just give us a call <laughs> <laughs> oh i'll have to take a look at i'll have to take another look at all the different classes again and see what would fit best with some Smug asshole, stealing hearts and diamonds, <laughs> being flirty, but like successfully so. Unlike Nas, all the women only, only successful when it really doesn't matter, or when we end up with some other character related to transportation. So this was lots, was lots of fun, of but. I, uh, I need to go to dinner. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm and I'm going to go to bed. Yeah. I'm so, going to eat all of the groceries I got. Yep. yep. Thanks, guys. Oh, we should do it more often. Yeah. Yes. Hope that 
you know, any listen back, people will enjoy this. So, good night. Night.